Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this video we'll talk about the light installation I did in my room. So I can have pretty nice lights. But first a small announcement. As you've probably seen or not, in all the previous videos uh, I added subtitles with the transcript of the video. I will stop doing this because it is just too much effort. It takes around two full days to transcript a half an hour video and this is just too much work for too little gain. So I will stop doing the transcripts of my videos. I will still add subtitles so I can correct my mistakes or I can add more information about what I say. But let's come back to my light installation. So in the beginning I had like in almost every room and in every apartment just a light installation just here in the middle with light bulbs coming out. And it wasn't bright enough for me. So I decided, well, I will do my own light installation. And since LEDs are now a trend, I will do something with LEDs. And then I discovered this and I, I wanted to do something better than just light bulbs. I discovered this LED strips, which you can see here. And this provide me some homogeneous light over the whole room. Instead of having a center point which lights in every direction, I have uh, the brightness which is distributed along the ceiling and which somehow illuminates the room um, a bit more the, the, with the same brightness in the whole room. For switching on and off, so I've also added a bit more features because I'm a nerd and I want to do something else. Here now I can use a remote to switch on and off, additionally to the normal switch which you have on the on the wall. So I can switch on and off, but I can also switch modes. As you can see, we have several light strips and there are different colors. They have different colors. The idea is that here I would have LED strips which have a cool white. This is around 9000 degree Kelvin. Here in the center, you then have LEDs which have a normal white, around 6500 Kelvins or 6000 Kelvins. And here on the right, you have LEDs which have a, a warm white, around um, 3000, 3500 Kelvin. It's not that precise. These LED strips are also not too expensive. For a, a 5 meter strip, you pay between 15 and 25 dollars. And five meters is these two strips. I cut it in half and each line is two and a half meter. And the idea of having modes is that I can change the ambience of the room. So this way I just have the brighter light, the more cold light, but still enough light. And you cannot see it, but let me show you. Shoop. Here on the left is my workbench. So with the cold light, I can concentrate on my work and I have bright light. Then if I can, if I want to go to the couch, I can switch to the more warm light, which is cozy and which doesn't wake you up so much. So you have different moods which you can install. And if I would just want to have a lot of light, I switch on all the LED strips. I can also change the brightness of all the LED strips or of individual LED strips. And this is how I program modes. And yeah, that's my light installation. In the middle you have the power source and then you have the distribution a bit everywhere and we'll have a more detailed look. This light installation is already two years old and you, can, you cannot see it here, you can just a bit guess it here that the LEDs somehow faded and and not the same way each other. You can see it particularly on these warm white LED strips. Here you have LEDs which are less bright than here. You can see it also here you have some LEDs which which are less bright so they, they're a bit more dim. On these strips actually the LED are almost as white as in the beginning, the normal whites. And here you cannot see it, but you can guess it, also the color change. And normally this should be cool white LEDs, so they should be blue around 
9000 degrees Kelvin. They're not blue anymore, they're just white. They change the color over time and you can see it clearly here over two years the the blue components of this color just faded away. And I don't think that these ones were as yellow as they used to be now. So I think here the color change here. What I'm surprised is these LEDs. These LEDs almost didn't change color. So I pretty much appreciate it. Um, and they are still as bright. Here you can see a small hole in the LEDs. This is actually just one segment which um, has a manufacturing problem. So there's just no light coming, uh, coming in. They're not dimmer. They're just no, no light anymore. But else, all the LEDs are working quite nice. So this is the best result. Here we can see the other side. And probably what's more interesting for you now is this board. This is a custom board which I did. So da -da -da, let's get here. This is an ATX power supply, which you generally have on computers. This is a custom board. And then I have an additional fan to, to cool the board. We'll see why. And then we have cables. So I can attach the LEDs to this blue post. And then we have cables running around and going to the LED strips. And this is how I can control the, the, um, the segment by themselves. Each LED strip is connected to a different port and then I can control the board using this board. Here on the right, you can even see there is an infrared receiver. This is why I can use this remote. I've just programmed the infrared code into this board. The reason why I make this video now is that I have to remove this light installation. In a couple of weeks, I have to move out of this flat and I have to put back the original light system which was there with central bulbs coming from, from, from this hole. Um, I have this installation since two years now. This is also why you see the aging on the, on the LEDs. Um, the second reason why I have to, why I want to remove this light installation, it's just because it's too loud. The, ATX box, which you see here, is not the first one. I already, I, I had another one, which was there for at least two years because I've got it from an old computer. So it was five, four years old and it's died a couple of days ago. It was there for, for, for two years. It worked quite well and I had to replace it because I still need some light with this ATX box. And this ATX power supply is just too loud. If I switch it on, you can hear two things. You can hear the fan turning and you can hear a sort of hum. If, I, if this changes also if I uh, change the light configuration. Here you don't hear the hum again. You only hear the fan louder. And now you can hear the hum. I don't know if you can hear it on the camera, but let's measure how loud it is. This is a GM1351 cheap sound meter. And this will give you a rough idea of how loud it is. So let's be quiet. The ambient noise is around 39 dBAs. And if I now switch on the power supply, the, the LED installation, You see it jumps to 42, 43, and then goes back to around 40 dBAs. And this is f already far away from the, from the power source, but this is around where I have my head, where, where I'm holding this. And for a system which is only meant to produce li light, it's, it's pretty noisy. There are two things which are noisy. There is that there's first this fan here to cool the board, and then there's the fan inside the ATX power supply. This is the most noisy thing. The hum also comes from the power supply because it's a pretty old um, style. But let's let me show you the difference with some kind of use this. I will just block the fan of the power supply, switch it back on. 
and here you can already hear quite some difference. You only hear the hum now, you don't hear the noise, the, the fan turning. Let's have it back on. Thirty-nine point one dBAs, so it's a bit louder because of the hum, but we don't have the the fan anymore. And this fan is still turning. I've only blocked the fan from the ATX power supply. If I switch the mode, you can hear the hum, and now there is no hum anymore. I wanted to have it this way. This small noise does. Uh, um, is, is quite okay. And this is what I had with the first power supply. I didn't have this super loud noise and I didn't have the hum. And because this power supply is is too noisy, to have it constantly on the whole day long and the whole evening long while you're watching a movie or while you're working, and because I have to move out, I will just remove the slight installation. And before I remove it, I will explain you how how it works and how I made it. So let's measure how much light my light installation produces. For that we will use this light meter, an HS1010A. It's a entry level, pretty cheap light meter, but it will give us a rough estimate of how much light it is. So if I switch it on, we see we are under daylight, it's 12 o'clock, and we have 300 lux. If I, this is the receiver. If I now switch on the LED source, we had 430 lux. So it's a lot brighter, it's 130 lux brighter than, than it used to be. Um, as you can see here, we have the reflections of the LEDs. This is another thing which I want to change for my next installation. Every time you make a video or photography, you will have these strips everywhere. And this is kind of a pain. Um, in the new installation, I think I will use um, plastic panels which diffuse the light. But yeah, so we have 430 lux around, and this is during the daylight, around noon. You can see it's a pretty sunny day today in Berlin. Let me get to the light meter. And we were in the center of the room. It's 10 o'clock, and let's see how much light the sun itself produces. The problem is this is north, so as and the light uh, does not come in my room, and this is why uh, I I need light in my room because the sun doesn't show me up, and you can see it, but the sun goes this way. If we look at the brightness outside, we see we are at around 470, but this is not lux, this is times 10. We are around 4,700 lux. So it's quite bright, and this is in the shade only. We are not in the in the sun, but for for Berlin, it's quite a sunny day today. We'll also have a look just to compare using one of these compact compact fluorescent lamps. So this is what should replace your incandescent lamp. This is the one from IKEA. It's an ES. Try to focus. Yes, 11L0602, 11 watts, 350 lumen, 80 milliampere. Um, let me plug in and then we will see the difference up in light. The same spot. And this is really under the light itself. So with this lamp, I only have, I've jumped from 300 lux to 317 lux. Um, and there, there you can see that the, my LED installation made quite some difference. Even during the light, we have 100 lux to 110 lux more. And with this um, fluorescent lamp, we only have 20 lux more. And this is why it should replace. Uh, and this is an 11 watt already, which I think it's comparable to a 60 watt incandescent, incandescent light. Light, and I hate these fluorescent lamps. You also have to change it every two years because you, the filament which is inside will burn first. The gas will still stay, but the filament by switching on and off frequently will burn out, not work anymore, and you have to still to change them. And also with with time, they take half an hour to get bright. Um, 
and yeah this is this is a pain and I didn't want to have this complex fluorescent light anymore so I wanted to test LEDs you switch it on immediately you can control the brightness very easily they're pretty efficient and you don't have to change them so often the time is now 22 or 6 so it's pretty dark outside and this is a good time to see how much light we produce switch on the light and have a look at the light meter we see it produces around 130 lux and this is what we've also seen during the day I will put it here and if we move it around it doesn't change a lot 110 120 and that's one advantage of these LED strips is that the, the light is at the same intensity, has the same brightness over the whole room. I'll leave it here and we will try the compact, compact fluorescent lamps. Let's switch off the LED strips. Start the compact fluorescent lamp. So this is the 11 watt compact fluorescent lamp. It will need, it's, it's quite new, so it doesn't need a lot of time to, to warm up. And it's, uh, it produces 20 lux, 22, and you see it increases over time. So you already see that these, these lamps require some time before they get bright. 23, 28, <clears throat> let's add. But you see, the difference is quite high between 130 and then 30 lux. The difference, let's add another one. This is an additional 8 watt of compact fluorescent lamp. We are at 50 lux and it's increasing slowly. And here, another additional 8 watt compact fluorescent lamp. So here we have three compact fluorescent lamps, although they are two small ones. And we are around 80 lux. Probably this will increase up until 100 lux. And we are very close to the lamp itself. The lamps are almost above the sensor. If you go a bit away of this place, you will see. Let me take the camera with me. This is the end of the room. And at the other room, we have only 20, 20 lux. This is the outside of the apartment building. And try to guess where my room is. As you can see, most of them use incandescent light or fluorescent tubes, which are a bit yellow. And mine is almost the brightest room. And it's this one. Up with the more bluish light. It appears to be more bluish because you are accustomed to the yellow light, but actually it's white and, and not really blue, as you've seen on the, the other videos. And it's pretty useful and whenever I come whenever someone comes to my apartment they can directly find out if I'm here or not because of this light.
Now I dismounted the whole LED light installation which I had in my room and we'll go through the components. So first we have this power adapter. This is the power source for the LED strips. It's a standard ATX power supply which you find in your, in your PCs. Then we have the LED strips themselves. This is the normal white, this is the warm white, this is the cold white. 5 meter LED strips. And you connect the power here. They require 12 volt to operate, all, uh, each of them. And to connect them, I just soldered these barrel jack connectors to, to these points. And then I had cables to plug to these connectors and to go to the controller board. So long cables so I can uh, put them everywhere in the room, spaced, and they connect here. This is where you connect these cables to provide power to the LED strips. And this is the LED controller board. As you can see, there are not a lot of components on it, mainly a microcontroller and then this huge thing is a power resistor. And because of this power resistor, I had to use a fan to cool it down. Although this fan is too, too big, but it was a standard computer fan which was lying around and it did the job. And the last thing was this remote to control the, to control the, this light. See, here we have the remote. The infrared receiver demodulator and that's it that's all the components I'll go in details why I chose these ones and um, describe them so the first component is this power source this is a standard ITX power supply which you find in modern desktop computers they are quite handy and I use them simply because they provide 12 volts and 5 volts. This is what you can see on the side here. Up. They provide they have they provide 12 volts, 11 amperes, so you can put a lot of power inside. And 12 volt is the voltage required by these LED strips. And these provide 12 volts. And then they provide 5 volts at 30 ampere, even more, and 3 volt at 16 ampere. So these are all the powers you need for, for LEDs. I use the 12 volt for the LED strips and the 5 volt for the LED controller. Because they are so cheap um, and because you can find them everywhere because they provide a lot of power, I just decided to use them for my light installation. It was lying around, so I just used it. Normally you have a lot more connectors. You can see here I cut most of them. So the connectors which are used to power um, the hard disk drive, the CD-ROMs and so on, these are gone. And I just use these two connectors. You may know this one mainly. This is the P1 connector and this is the main connector. It provides the 303 volt, 303 volt sense and a lot of other wires. 12 volts, 5 volts, and it enables you to switch on the ATX power supply. This P3 connector, it's an additional connector, uh, provides you with an additional 12 volts. So you can have even more power for even more LED strips. And I have the mounting holes on the side to put the LED, um, LED controller on it to mount the LED controller. Yeah, so that was, the reason was because it was laying around, it provides all voltages, it provides enough current to provide uh, energy for numerous LED strips and it's easy to use and it's readily available. But this ATX power supply was not my first one. This is a replacement part. And this is the one which is really, really loud. Although it says here, with noise killer. Um, it is really. In the beginning I had this one. It has a bigger fan. Uh, it's a lot lighter. It doesn't use a main transformer, but the problem is that it's, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so I had to replace it. We'll try out. Let me provide power. Up. This is the ATX 
breakout board for the Android prototype. It's pretty a pretty simple board and pretty convenient. You just connect this P1 connector from an ATX power supply, and then you have all the voltages which it provides. So you have ground, 12 volt, 5 volt, 3 to 3 volt. Some even provide minus 12 volts, or uh, most of them provide minus 12 volt, and some provide even minus 5 volt. If we connect it. Then we switch on the power supply. Here we can see mains OK. So the power supply has a separate 5 volts uh, small standby power, which is provided here. This is where you can see the LED on, although the fan is not turning on the ATX power supply. So you always have a 5 volt uh, standby power supply. You cannot draw a lot of energy from it, but enough to provide a motherboard in sleep mode and so on. And then when you push on this button, you you short a pin which is called power on. So you short it to ground and when you short it to ground it will turn on the power supply. And what's happening here is that you probably didn't see it quite well, so let's start again. This is the fan. Now I press on the button, and you can see it started, and just after it, it stopped. We can see it also, normally when you power it on, you have around 500 milliseconds until the power level are high enough, and then it, there is a second pin, another pin, which tells you power good. And this power good signal tells, okay, the power supply is completely on, all the voltages are stable enough, you can do whatever you want to provide power and to switch on. Here, if I press on the button, you briefly see it blinking and then it stops. Although, no, it doesn't even blink. Here, it tries to provide powers to, to, these, to this port. So, if we start again, you see there's a short blink. So, the capacitors charge and then they, can't, they, they will discharge. And the power is not good. So, we know that this ATX power supply is broken. We'll have a look inside to see if we can find the reason. This is the inside of this ATX power supply. There are not too many components and it's a pretty simple switching power supply. Be aware when you unmount power supplies that they were connected to earth. So this huge capacitor is sometimes charged and it can charge up to 550 volts and 220 ampere. So it's really a lot of energy and you don't want to, to take this shock. So what you do is just find the pins for this capacitor and you short it out to be sure that no power is in the capacitor anymore. Sometimes you will see sparks, but it's better that you see sparks on your screwdriver than on your hands. Um, when power supply fail, the main reason is because of these electrolytic uh, aluminium foil capacitors. They age quite a lot and then the internal resistance gets quite high, they don't store uh, as much energy as they use in the beginning. But here we see they, they're not budged. Also the smaller one which are here are not budged. And if we can zoom on the board, if we look at all the ICs, we didn't, uh, I didn't see any IC which was blown or which was somehow damaged, which could cause this power supply to fail. I didn't invest more time simply because these power supplies are cheap and this one is already quite old so I used it two years long every day for power for you for providing power to my LED strips and it was previously used in a computer for at least two years so even if one component failed after four years it's not worth to repair it because the other one will fail just soon afterwards so you just take a new ATX power supply. They're very common, they're getting better all the time, and they're not too expensive. So, but that, that was the inside of the power supply, and you can see a lot of power traces. Now let's talk about the LEDs. 
We have three different stripes with three different colors. These are still white LEDs. We have first this normal white, which has a color temperature of around 6,000 to 6,500 degrees Kelvin. Then we have a cold white, which uh, looks more bluish, which has a bluish stains. It's around 9,000 degrees Kelvin. And then we have a warm white, which has more uh, yellowish color, which is around 3,500 degrees Kelvin. The yellowish light is probably more comfortable and more cozy for for the eye and this is what you used to have from incandescent light. This white is just pure white and this blue, this uh, cool light is a bit more bluish like you probably see or sometimes on cars when they have xenon lights. This is this kind, this kind of blue and it's a very bright uh, white. No matter which white you use, your eye gets accustomed to, to the white. So if you stay long enough with one color, you will think, okay, this is the white color. And then um, if you just compare it to another color if, and you switch another different white on, then you will see, okay, the previous one was really more yellowish or more bluish. And I took the, the three different colors so I can spread it over my room, whatever I need. I use the cool white on the workbenches in the front and they are narrower so I have more light. The yellow, the normal white, the plain white in the middle, and but also a bit more located in the front, and then the yellow white in the back where I have my sofa and where I can relax. Also, this yellow white uh, will not be above the, the screen, it will just be above my my sofa. It will be, not be in the, in the line of sight. So we've talked about the colors, but another difference is also, so all these are five meters long. This looks a bit smaller, but it's it's still five meters long. The first difference is the LED size. These are called SMD 3528, and the 3528 defines the size. So if we take the caliper, and measure the here, this direction we have here around 2.8 millimeters and if we measure the height we have around 3.5 millimeters so it's hard to measure exactly because of the solder so um, that's one of the few times where you use metric units when you talk about SMD parts because generally if you use SMD and then you have a number with it, it's in, in mils but not in in metrics. But look all the time on the on the sheet to, to be sure what unit is. Here it's a metric unit. So here have one, uh, th you have all the time three LEDs per segment. And what is good is that these three LEDs consume 12 volts. You can cut here, solder again, and then this segment also consumes 12 volts. So you can cut the segments as, as much as you want and you can re-glue them as much as you want. These LEDs are a bit smaller and they have 120 of them per, per meter. This means that in total I have 500 LEDs, no, 600 LEDs for 5 meters. Uh, these are narrower and this is a bit better if you want to have some kind of uniform contrast. But they are a bit bigger and it's only one LED. The second aspect is it's just LEDs on a copper strip and on the back there was tape, nothing else. If we look, now look at these LEDs, we have some kind of pr plastic protection on top of it. This is um, what they often call IP65, so it's a class of protection and one of the characteristics is that it protects from, from splashed water. So if you have only droplets of water, it will not make any damage to, to these strips. That's the first difference. So I'm not sure if this is really a good idea. Since this gets on the ceiling, there will be no dust on there. There will be also no water splash. Here we have this, which probably will take a bit of brightness because it's still plastic, so it consumes a bit of brightness. Not too much though. Um, you have your fingerprints on it. Um, the 
the dust gets a bit sticky on it and also it keeps the warmth inside so the LEDs cannot cool. The LEDs don't get too warm but maybe it has an effect of the, on the life durability, I don't really know. So I recommend for ceiling light to take one which don't, do not have IP65 protection or any kind of protection, just leave it in the air. Here you can see we have the segments also bigger, so we again have uh, three LEDs per segment. You can cut here and then resolder the 12 volts. Um, and you can see there are less LEDs, actually twice less LEDs. We have only 60 LEDs per meter, meaning for 5 meters we will have 300 LEDs. But you can also see another difference. Here we have three points inside one of these um, LEDs. So we have three LEDs inside one packaged LED. And the format of these is SMD 5050 because if you measure it's around 5 millimeters um, in height and it's 5 millimeter in length. Um, so these are the, the, the different formats. But again, I recommend the smaller ones for some reason, so this is, you have more LEDs per meter, so the brightness is more uniform. Somehow I have the feeling they are a bit brighter, but also more importantly, uh, the, there is no protection, which you don't need. And they keep the color. I don't know why, but this one kept the color. This one don't keep, didn't keep the color, the, the original color. And it will have a, I will show you actually the, the three LEDs when the lids on. I'll show you directly. So here is the power supply with the LED controller board. And here we have the 5 meters LED strips and the cat. And as you can see, the middle one, the white one, is as bright everywhere, but the two other ones are not um, as bright everywhere, particularly the yellow one. If we can zoom here, for example, we see these are less bright. On the blue one, it's less visible, but if I go to another place, like this one, we also see that the middle one, uh, the, the one, the blue one is not as bright. And this is also why I prefer the, the white one in the middle, because it kept its color, its color, and it kept its brightness everywhere. As you can see, five meter is pretty long. And because you can easily cut it into segments of three LEDs, you can shorten it as almost as you would like, and then put it on the ceiling and arrange them. Incandescent light bulbs like these are being phased out because they are pretty inefficient. Only 3% of the power they received is transformed into visible light. Most of the rest is just converted to, to heating. And while it's useful during the winter if you want to heat your room, in the summer it's pretty much a, a waste of energy. This is why they came with this compact fluorescent lamp to replace the incandescent lamp. These are a bit better in efficiency. 10% of, in uh, of the energy they receive will be converted to visible light. This is including the transformator ballast, which is just in, in there. And LEDs in the end, or well, in the end, right now are replacing it because around 15% of the energy is used to is converted into visible light and this is a bit more efficient. It varies a lot on LEDs depending on the 
on the power of the single LED, if you have LED strips, on the converter you, you use, but it gives you a rough estimate. Still, if 15% is converted into light, the rest is mostly converted into, into heat. And this is what we will see here. So you will see it particularly well if because I didn't roll out the LEDs, so the heat just stays concentrated on the LEDs. And you will see the temperature rising. You see the, the temperature sensor, uh, not very accurate, but the main in the most important information to, is to see how fast the temperature rises. So with that, let's start. As you can see in the middle, the, the uncovered the LED strip without protection is heating a lot faster. This is because the temperature sensor is right on the metal. On the other ones, there is a plastic sort of plastic protection and this stops from being contacted directly on the metal, but also it takes time to warm up. So there will be a delay before the temperature rises fast or the temperature rises at the same level. But the LED strip will get as warm. After 10 minutes we will switch it off and we will see how fast the temperature goes down again. Also you have to keep in mind that the temperature of the LEDs will affect their efficiency and also, and most importantly, their durability. They, they won't last as long as they are, if they are all the time at a very high temperature. And also the fluorescent material within the LED, which sets its color, will degrade differently depending on the temperature. This is also what we probably seen on the um, on the LED is that with the temperature they, it, it just changed the color and some faded out and some some other state. The blue faded out quite fast while the orange one just increased. And as we can see the LEDs without coating, the temperature of the LEDs without coating drops a lot faster. This is because it's in direct air contact. Even though here they are rolled up when they are on rolled, the, the, the air contact is even higher. And the one which are coated, uh, well, the coating gained energy and has some kind of heat reservoir. This is why the temperature is just going down slowly. Also because plastic is not very good at transferring energy, while bare metal, which is the trip itself, this um, spreads energy quite well and releases energy a lot better than this plastic coating. To connect the LED strips to the board I use these connectors. They are pretty common with LED strips. So these are barrel jack connectors with a 2.1 mm inner, inner diameter and 5.5 mm outer diameter. Um, as I said they are pretty common and they are they are quite cheap and they can transport enough current. And in the end, to, to put the strips a bit everywhere in the room, I used very thin 1.5 mm brass copper audio cable. I think 1.5 mm of copper core is quite, is, is a bit too much. And I even had to cut this bending protection so I could fit these cables. So I would use a bit smaller. But the idea is that I have uh, as low resistance as possible on these cables because they will transport a lot of current and this way the voltage drop will be lower. Now let's have a look at the LED controller board. As you can see, there are not a lot of components, and it's a it's actually a pretty simple board. So in the center, you have the main microcontroller. This is an Atmel 80 Mega 328P. It's the same microcontroller which you find on on Arduino's. Um, I provided another clock. This is a 13.432 megahertz clock, so I can provide a very precise clock and have very fine, uh, generate very fine PVM signals. Here we have the power input. This is from the P1 connector from your ATX power supply. It provides you 3 volts, 
5.5 volts, 12 volts, and stand some other signal. Um, I use the 5 volt standby, which the, you can see the trace here, for the microcontroller and for the peripherals, like for, for this components. So this is a standby voltage, and you will receive 5 volts even if you have no, if the ATX is not switched on as is. It provides enough current for this microcontroller. Um, th this is connected to two pins, the power OK, the power on. So the power on, if you put it low, then it will start the ATX power supply. And the ATX power supply will somehow reply with a power OK. It has 500 milliseconds to tell if the voltage is stable enough, and it will indicate you on the pin if the voltage is stable enough. The microcontroller verifies this, and after one second, if it's not stable enough, it will switch off the power supply, if the power supply didn't do it itself. On the left here, we have the in-system programming port, the ISP6 pin header, to program this microcontroller. Um, then we have here just a smoothing capacitor for the voltage, for the 5 volts. These are just two small capacitors for the clock. This is an indication LED and it will tell me if the microcontroller is on and ready to, to be used. So yeah, whenever it receives power and all the state is okay, this LED will just stay on. Here we have an infrared demodulator. It operates at 38 kilohertz and this one allows me to use this remote. This remote was provided for another receiver and it simply transmits over infrared at a PVM modulated frequency of 38 kilohertz some signals. So I just figured out what signal this one sends and I programmed in in this way. So this way I can switch on and off the power, change between modes, increase or decrease the brightness of all LEDs or uh, LED strips actually, the channels, or select the channel individually and then increase, decrease the brightness of this channel. And this is per mode, and I have three modes which I can switch here. Then here we have a serial port. So here I will simply connect a USB to serial converter and I can directly talk to the microcontroller and send commands. For example, setting the brightness of which channel very specifically. And there is a command interface for this serial, for the serial port. Next to it, you see the two lines are also going to the, to, to this connector. This is actually this was sort to connect some Bluetooth converter. So it takes you out and on the other side it provides Bluetooth. So the idea w was that I could connect with my, my smartphone and using the smartphone I can connect to LEDs um, and the LED strips as I would over serial port. In the end I never implemented it but it's it's quite a nice feature and I think I will do it afterwards. But this remote was, was enough for now, particularly because it, there was no fancy fancy mode or fancy fancy feature. Then we have these posts and these are actually the channel. We have five channels on the left and five channels on the right. So I have 10 channels and with 10 channels I can control 10 LED strips. Each channel has one power MOSFET. These are N-channel MOSFETs and two resistors. One resistor is to, to pull down the gate. So whenever there is a tree state or whenever the board starts, the LEDs are switched off and the, uh, the PMOS is switched off. The other one is also at the gate, but it's between the gate and the microcontroller. And the idea is to use it as ring back protection. So whenever you switch very often, very high current on the PMOS, it is recommended to have a limiting resistor between the, the pin driving it and the gate. And this is the case here. Um, this PMOS take the 12 volts from the power supply and switch it on and, on and off on the ground. Um, these are Fairchild RFD 14N05L. 
So the most important thing is that they support 50 volts. They can handle 14 amperes. And uh, they, own, they have a on resistance of only 0 0.1 ohm. So it doesn't consume a lot of power when the strips are on. And even if they are on, on the back you see there is a whole heating element or metal to, to get to remove the heat. I didn't have to put it on the copper. Using uh, having it in in free air was, was good enough. Here we have a um, power resistor. It, it's quite huge. It's 4.7 ohm. And the reason for this is actually because the power which is provided by the ATX power supply to 12 volt rails will get better if there is also some power consumption on the 5 volt rails. Here I only use the standby 5 volt rails, but else I don't use the normal 5 volt rails which is provided by the power supply. This is why I, I use this power resistor so I can burn energy and with burning this energy on the 5 volt rails, the 10, 12 volt rails will be better. And as you can see on this picture, on the complete left, on the top, you have two, you have the ATX power supply, and on the bottom you have a standard 12 volt um, transformator, which was provided actually with one of the LED strips. It's a cheap Chinese comp, uh, part. Next to it, you have a power meter. This will show me how much the ATX power supply or the transformator on the bottom consumes in watts. On the left, the leftmost um, multimeter will, men, um, will measure the current which is going through the LEDs. Just next to it, the small multimeter is measuring the voltage at the LED input and the last multimeter is measuring the voltage and at the LED output. So with this setup, I've tried the different power supplies with and without a 10 ohm resistor. This is only for the 7 ohm resistor. And you can see on this spreadsheet that actually the voltage are better provided by the ITX power supply, but also the resistor does make a difference and it gives you a more stable voltage, 12 volts if you have 5 volts, which are also drawn off this power supply. I think this has to do with how the switching power supply has been implemented into these, um, into these ATX power supplies. And then here we have a connector for a fan. So this is a 3-pin three, three fan. You provide power and ground and the last pin is a tachometer which will tell you how fast the, the motor spins. I use this because here we have a power resistor. This is at 5 volts and at 4.7 ohms so it will consume 30, 28, around 28 watts will be just burned into energy, into heat. And we have to, to, to get rid of this heat. This is why I have to use a fan. So you connect the fan and whenever the power is switched on, the, multi the microcontroller will verify using a tachometer if the fan is turning or not. If after three, three seconds the fan is not turning fast enough, then it will switch off the power supply just as protection because this needs to be cooled. Another good effect is when this is cooled, well then we have also air flowing on this PMOS. So these PMOS will also get cooled, although they are not very warm, it's a nice side effect. And the last thing which you see here, the so 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 budge, it's actually on this pin um, I you have to disconnect this pin and you can put a capacitor if you want to use the internal voltage sensor. So this microcontroller has an internal voltage sensor and I use it to verify if the board gets hot or not. If the temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius, then I switch off the power supply because this is 
getting too warm and I don't want to damage the board or, or anything else. So this is why this measures the onboard temperature. It's the one which is inside here, so it's not perfect, but it will still indicate what is happening with this power resistor or on the board in general. And that's actually that's actually it. This is the more thing. And these channels, oh yes. So how I change the brightness is I use a PVM signal, so pulse width modulation. And the duty cycle will just define how bright the LED strips are. For that I I, I use this microcontroller. But this microcontroller doesn't have enough PVMs to support 10 channels. I think it has 2 times 2 so you can have a negative or not. You negative on each PVM. Because I want two, ten, um, 10 channels, I had to implement the PVM in software. It's pretty easy, but uh, it's, this still had to be done. Another little is this port here. I also use the P3 port, which is provided by the power supply. This is an additional 12 volt port. So, Depending on the wattage of your ATX power supply, you have a limitation on the on the 12 volt which is provided here. For example, if you have a 350 watt ATX power supply, the 12 volt which is provided here, it provides up to 10 amps. And 10 amps are just barely enough for five channels. If you think that each LED strip uses around two amps, then 10 amps is good for, for five channels. And this is why I use the second um, 12 volt source, which is connected here, so I can provide five additional channels and control five streets, five, five other LED strips. And the idea was also to regulate and to balance the load because I would have three channels used here, three channel source used here, so the load on the 12 volt rails will be distributed between the two of them. This is actually what I thought in the beginning. And this is why also in the back, so the PCB was manufactured using a CNC milling machine, which insulates the, the traces here, which is, that's quite nice for prototyping. On the front, this copper plane, this is ground. And I have a huge crowd. On the back, we see we have two different couple planes. This is the 12 volt which is provided by this port. And this is filled with the 12 volt provided by this port. And you have a clear separation and I wanted huge, um, huge copper so I can spread it as, as good as I can. And then this is where on the binding post the 12 volt is connected. This trace here, the six, this sick trace, is actually the ground where I switch on and off because these are uh, end channel MOSFETs. And we have two planes. So I thought that because you have two different 12 volt power supply, you would have two different transformers. But I've learned that actually this is not really how it works. It would be too expensive to put in power supplies two different um, two different sources for providing 12 volts. So what they do is they have a single 12 volt power supply and then they provide it to two, but they have a current limiter. So here on this one they have a current limiter of 10 amp, some sort of, of a fuse, and here they will have a current limiter of 13 amp um, for 300 uh, 50 watts. So in the end, I didn't, I wouldn't have to separate these two planes. I could just join them and it wouldn't be any matter because the 12 volts are from the same power supply. But should you, you should verify it on your power supply before you make this assumption. It's just very often the case and it's cheaper to do it this way than to have separate 12 volts power supplies. So here we'll demonstrate uh, that's the tachometer is red at kind of security. So if I put on the LED and then if I block the fan after three seconds, because it couldn't read any uh, speed on the tachometer, it will switch off the power supply as security measure. And the same happens if the temperature is um, above 60 degrees Celsius on this microcontroller. 
When I bought the LED strip, I bought it with a simple power supply, which I use for beginning from being to test, but also with the dimmer. And this is where I got the remote control for. And this is the dimmer. On the left, you can see the infrared demodulator. In the middle, you can see the dimmer itself. And then on the right, and then you can dim the lights. And, but do not, do not trust these cheap Chinese dimmers. As you can see here, I put two LED strips instead of one LED strip at the end. And I switched it on and after uh, five minutes to, to ten minutes it started smelling weird. And when I looked at this dimmer I saw a burn mark on it. Here we have a closer look and this just looked quite weird. It also didn't smell quite well. And if you open it you can already see it's black. And in the inside you see the component completely burn. And this could have caused a, a, a fire actually. So they didn't have any protection on the thing. They didn't have any current limiting protection. And the uh, transistor which they used for this dimming, like I do, wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to uh, handle that much current which is needed by the two LED strips. So it simply burned. So yeah, do not trust these cheap Chinese LED dimmers. They work uh, just in the case they've been designed for, meaning it was just for one LED strip. Now let's analyze <coughs> the, how I change the brightness. And for that, we will simply use a photovoltaic uh, plate, which will receive the light. And this, with this, you can show uh, what the, the frequency is. So let's switch on the light. And here you can clearly see the PVM signal. And you can even see it flickering on the camera. With the naked eye you cannot see it because it's higher than um, 20, 20 hertz. But this is currently at around 150 hertz as you can see here. And 150 hertz is a multiple of this camera. This camera now shoots at 50 frames per second. And you can see it flickering on the camera. <coughs> And this is you, uh, what you see from the photovoltaic plate. And as you can see, it is on for a short while and then it is off most of the time. I have five steps of five steps of brightness. Actually, ten steps of brightness, exactly. I have ten steps of brightness. And if I increase the brightness, you see that it simply increases the width of this on signal all the time. Here I increase the brightness, so the duty signal increases until it reaches 100%. And now it's all the time on. And you won't see it flickering anymore because it doesn't switch off and on all the time. It's just on. If I just decrease the duty cycle, uh, it decreases the brightness. But I did a clever trick, is that now if I want to switch off the, 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 the second LED, the brightness of the second LED, I will not switch it off exactly as this. And let me show it to you. Here. If I increase the brightness, you see here there's a small dimple on the side to the next to it. And this is changing all the time. So this is smaller than the one on the left because this is just in front of uh, this photovoltaic plate is just in front of this LED. This is the first bright which you see. And then the second one is this LED strip. And this is what you see is that whenever you switch on the second one, I do not just switch it on the same time, but I switch it out afterwards. And I spread it over the whole frequency. So first I switch on this LED strip at its duty cycle. When this is finished, then I switch on the next LED strip, depending on the, on the PVM, so on the duty cycle, and so on, until I go through, the, uh, through each strip. And the idea is to spread the load um, on the power supply, I don't want all LEDs to go on right at the beginning and draw like 20 uh, amperes 
of current at the beginning for just 25% of the time and then drop everything. Instead, I will have the first use uh, 10 amperes and then the next one just after which will continue using the 10 amperes for its duty cycle. And with that, I share the loads over, the, over time on this ATX power supply so I don't have this high ripple noise. And I'll show you on the board itself how it looks like. We've seen it on the voltage plate, but I'll show you on the board. So now we have channel one of the oscilloscope connected to the gate of the first transistor for this channel, which is channel one of the LED strips. And we have the channel two of the oscilloscope connected to the gate of the second transistor. And if we look on detail on the oscilloscope, we will see better the load sharing. So let's switch on the power supply. And here we can see the, the duty cycle, which is for the first LED strip. So the frequency at which uh, it operates, this PVM is modulated, is around 140 Hertz. It's not very precise and it's only done in software, no, not in hardware. I use timers for that. You can change this. Um, this frequency in the software itself. And if I increase the brightness for channel one, it will increase the duty cycle. Now if I switch to channel two, this way, and if I increase the brightness of channel two, you see it doesn't overlap with channel one, but it continues. And this way it shares the loads over time. So I was quite happy by by my uh, light installation, um, it was pretty. It wasn't too complicated to make it. I didn't know a lot of electronic at when I started it, but it worked quite well. It served me for two years, and it didn't cost a lot. But there are still some things I will change when I will do my next light installation. First, I will not use these ATX power supplies anymore, simply because. Um, they are, I had one available, but these are really bulky, they are loud, they provide 5 volts, and to have stable 12 volts, you need to put some kind of load on the 5 volt rails. And so they, are, they are too big. Instead, I will use a dedicated 12 volts uh, power supply. So this provides only 12 volts, provides 17 amperes. And it doesn't have any fan. I think 17 amperes is the most which you can have without any fan. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple to connect. You just have the, the voltage and you can adjust the voltage uh, to 12 volts on the end supply just by using this, this trim pot. Uh, it's a lot smaller than this. It's quiet and it, it does the job. It doesn't cost too much money either. I think I got it for 30 euros. So that will save me fans, noise and uh, the bulkiness. Also, I will not use this microcontroller anymore. Well, it was a good microcontroller and it's sufficient enough to do everything, to receive infrared, to provide um, uh, serial, to uh, measure the, the, um, the speed of the fan using the tachometer, to measure the temperature, to see if this is not that high, and then to control the 10 channels. And you, you don't really need more than this microcontroller. The problem is that you have to do the pulse width modulation in software. And I will change to this microcontroller. This is a Maple Mini Leaf board and it uses an STM3032. This is an ARM Cortex microcontroller. It's a bit more powerful, but what's more important is that it provides more PVMs. And these are also quite readily available. So it will be simple to put this on a board. Also, I designed the board to put it on the side of the ITX power supply, and it has exactly the same size. And here you can see the mount holes. Um, I also decided to use only through hole components because these are very easy to solder. But uh, for the next one, I will, uh, I will do as small as I can uh, because board space just costs, costs more money. And also I will put surface mount components only and not through hole. They are smaller, they are cheaper, and they're not too hard to solder. 
the components can handle as well the thing. Probably only the capacitors will not be uh, surface mount. They will still be through hole electrolytic aluminum capacitors. And I will this time also put uh, the next time I will put this Bluetooth adapter so I can control it over Bluetooth for example using the smartphone or using the tablet and I will a bit uh, I will uh, improve the light so the light which you see the brightness was proportional to the duty cycle the problem is that the eye doesn't see it that way although the duty cycle increases proportionally the brightness in your eye is not the same and for that you need an alpha correction and I will implement the alpha correction in the next uh, software so whenever I increase the brightness to my eye the brightness increases uh, 10% more and not only to the duty cycle which is here and the increasing will be also smooth and not uh, like you've seen here it's directly from 10% to 20% this will be more smooth so it's more comfortable for the eye so these are all the small improvements which I'll implement using a 32-bit microcontrollers and create a new board uh, I will put the schematic, the PCBs, and all the information um, on the wiki. Um, so you'll see, you can just take it and do whatever you want with it. With that, enjoy!